Hey everybody, well, it's been a little while since we, Dr. Sonia and I have got a chance to, to record a podcast. We've been on hiatus, on vacation, enjoying uh, some family time together. And it was, a, it was a great conversation that we had today because it kind of just helped us jump back in the driver's seat again of our podcast life, having an amazing conversation with one of our dear friends, Dr. Amy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's a topic that we love to touch on. And it is all about trauma, but there's so much lightness that comes in these conversations because Dr. Amy just has a beautiful way of explaining all the, the micro moments that we move through and you know the fact that there is solutions to all that we have to navigate in our lives, whether it's from zero to six months old to adulthood and just all the patterns and how all of that is so connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there were so many conversations. We talked about crying it out. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you have to wait and tune into whether or not that's good or maybe and there's different strategies there. Uh, soothering, we talked about some of the early childhood development and how trauma can show up in our lives, how it could play out as an adult. I think some really important stuff there on the neurodevelopmental side of things. Mm-hmm. We also asked about our own lives and our challenges that we're facing right now with our oldest son. And it's just such a good example for all of us to tune into because it not only has to do with parenting, but just also maybe how we grew up and some of the challenges that maybe showed up and how we can navigate adulthood from a different perspective of different energy. We talked a lot about our energy reserves and when those are low, how everything feels more challenging and how much harder it is to disrupt or change these patterns that maybe we're stuck in. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think as we go through this conversation, it's it's great to be able to reflect on some of the things that we do move into habit with and maybe the things that we don't actually see that are traumas and how they're playing out in our lives and and this is something for everybody you know it doesn't have to be this you know really big heavy few things that happen in our lives it can be the many little things but are we willing to observe the behavior and our habits and how we show up in life as a way to start to reconcile some of our traumas from our past yeah so we go into some self-discovery some solutions and a lot of giggles because there's a lot going on here between Nick and I too when we're talking Um, so enjoy the conversation and please let us know what you learned from it and maybe questions that come up for you as well yeah and if you're you're checking out this uh, podcast too stay tuned to the end because uh, Dr. Amy is sharing her upcoming summit and so you're going to want to tune into the dates and get access to everything that's that's, uh, coming up with that one so tune into the end and uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited with Dr. Sonia and myself. Uh, we've been off on a little family vacation for the last couple of weeks, and we just really haven't recorded it or done a whole lot of work. We've done nothing. It's been amazing. <laughs> it's been so nice. We've yeah. been healing our trauma. Somehow by... I don't believe that done nothing. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is true. We were just so, trying to be more. Yeah. I think that, just yeah. Being... We, we actually, we were just getting off a little conversation on like, why could we just eat everything and our bodies like magically just digest everything without any dis- dif- discomfort. Mm-hmm. And like, there's just something different about the regular daily trauma of life and how it impacts your your mood, your digestion, your skin, your metabolism, so, your many, so many things, mm-hmm. right? Your sleep. Yeah, yeah. When you pluck yourself out of your everyday and you move into a space where you allow yourself to just be and connect, I think that makes a huge difference in just how we're processing yeah. The, the daily traumas like you were saying the daily stresses so, yeah um, yeah so it's a it, it's it's with that kind of context of conversation that we wanted to invite dr amy back on our new bestie who's who's apparently a biohacker and we didn't really even know until i had to stalk some of her in, instagram images and see what she was doing but uh welcome back amy thank you so much for being here let's talk about you as a biohacker and then let's get into some of the fun stuff that we're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> you you cannot separate my work as a biohacker from my work on trauma. Like for yeah. me, they are one and the same. Totally. Mm-hmm. Well, let's 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 hear a little bit about that because, I mean, you do look at the uh, how trauma impacts us, and you really dissect it in, in a really interesting way. I remember coming off of the conversation last time and going, "Wow, she really made me think about whether or not I should bring my grandma into a dark alley or a police officer." And I actually should chose the police officer, maybe for different reasons that than. Um, than uh than i would have suspected at the time because you know you kind of just threw that question on us and it was like well what's what's the immediate response so if you want to hear what i said you're gonna have to go back and listen to the first one 
But um, I think Sonia chose her grandmother. She did. She totally chose yeah. my grandma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a fun conversation. <laughs> yeah. She, she chose safety. I chose safety and nurturing. Or yeah. yeah, there was some other elements that were at play that Amy really brought out in our conversation. So yes, you guys have to go back and listen to that first conversation we had. Yeah. And even like another highlight that came out of the conversation was just how we relate to our, our kids and like there's a, an ideal maybe that I'm using with air quotes that have how we're supposed to show up as a, as a parent. And then because of the circumstances, maybe the kid needs something completely different. And so you really spoke some really beautifully about that in your own experience. So mm -hmm. we're really grateful for that conversation. So again, please go back and listen to the first one, but I want to hear about you as a biohacker and how the influences like what you do, because you're looking for disruption you're looking for ways to, to really like optimize, you know, connection and communication and all these things. Like I think of a biohacker, someone who's like not willing to just follow the status quo and it wants to look a little bit deeper. So let's, let's hear some of that perspective from you. Yeah. And I will, I will claim that title. Like I am a disruptor of trauma. Like that, that is, <laughs> that is me. Um, so when we look at the biology response of trauma in the body, all trauma and for those listening, you're going to want to want to write this down. All trauma is an energy problem because there is this normal neurobiological sequence that the body goes through. And by the body, I really mean like the body, the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. And it goes through a very specific sequence that will either leave it for a situation to just be a stress or for it to be a trauma. And for that shift to happen, for it to go from being a stress to a trauma, the difference is our internal resources, our internal energy resources. And so, yeah, like when, when I'm, when I'm working on my own system, learning how to bring energy into the system has been one of those pieces that I've brought in. So my biohacking has been just as much about healing those trauma places in me as it is about also having, you know, my, my best days and my best performance and my best health. So, so that's, that's what I will kind of throw out there to, to tease people with is that this understanding of, you know, trauma is, is really not as psychological as we think it is. It's entirely driven mm -hmm. by the response that our body is going through. And that difference between a stress and a trauma is all about energy and all trauma is an energy problem. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought that up and made that connection between. I also feel like the fire turned on when she said that. Oh, <clears throat> like I think it did. That was really cool. <laughs> Wasn't that? Or cool? maybe I just Maybe. noticed it. It was like the energy and the and then <clears throat> the flames. How much of a disruptor I am, Nick? There like you go. I just right. speak and <laughs> fire turns on. It's like magic is happening. This wizard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's a, totally what happened. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that connection, I think, is so important for all of us to understand, because often when we think trauma, we're thinking emotional body, we're thinking mental body, we're thinking about the psychology of it, but not everyone understands how deeply rooted it is in our organs inside of our cells and how that will impact the patterns that this biology then plays out. So we have to disrupt it, not only through some of the, you know, the typical talk therapies and things like that, that can be very helpful, but there's this other element of disrupting the physiology so that we can create that new pattern. And that's where the biohacking can come in mm -hmm. to really create this other resource that yep. we can rely on. Like we have something called brain tap that we use Mm -hmm. often and you know I, I think I'm a pretty good meditator and then there's some days where I wake up and I'm like I don't know if I'm going to get myself to that place where I need because maybe I'm in more of a darker space right now and I just need that little bit of help with something else so it helps me to disrupt that pattern quicker than maybe me doing that meditation on my own for 30 days versus maybe now this is going to happen in a week so I love that you made that connection and it really is about patterns Dr. Sonia, because we can have these patterns that really are starting even early in childhood without us knowing it, without us having clearly any trauma, abuse, neglect in childhood. There's so many micro traumas that happen that these patterns start to get wired into our nervous system. And then this is just always how we've been. And we assume that this is our personality. We assume that this is, this is me, love me or take me. This is me. And it's like, no, that's actually not you. 
-hmm. That's just a pattern that your system adapted to a long time ago. And at the time it served you. And so it kept it. And now that pattern is the very thing that's holding you back in more growth and more connection and more love in your life. And yet, because it's so habituated and because it's such a, a pattern that's been literally wired into your system, like it doesn't even second guess it. Our system will always go to what takes the least amount of energy to do. Like it's always looking for that. And it's not necessarily looking to cheat corners. It's just that our bodies are built on efficiency. And when it can get to an outcome in a, in an efficient, less energetic cost way, it's going to choose that path every time, every time. And so when we've got these patterns that it's just like, this is just, I, I, I do this pattern without even thinking about it. Then that's when you know that, oh my goodness, like we really need to come in with something powerful to disrupt this pattern so that we can choose a different way. We can create a different pattern that says, no, like with this stress in my life, rather than going to the trauma response of checking out, numbing out, zoning out, whatever that mindless thing is to get through, I'm going to stay present in this. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to take this one standing up. I'm not going to sit down for this. I'm not going to go up and curl in a ball. Like I'm going to take this one standing and I'm going to stay with this and I'm going to um, be responsible for being present for all of the challenges in my life. Wow. Like what a change, what a difference that would make for people if that became their new pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that self-awareness um, is so important in recognizing what pattern was ours to begin with and which one we learned. And one of the things that we do want to touch on today is like generational trauma mm -hmm. and not only generational trauma that gets passed down through the cells and the body, but also what we observe. Like for me, a big one with um, just that checking out was as soon as there was stress in my home, my mother would go in her room and the blankets would be over her head. And I noticed in myself when the kids were younger, I would have those moments of just wanting to do that. And it took so much energetic effort inside of me to tell myself, no, you're not going to go put the blanket over your head because that is not something I want to pass down to them. But I have to say it was so hard to do that. Like it's painful almost to not follow through with what's easy in that moment. And that's why every trauma is an energy problem. Because say you had other health issues going on, Sonia, at that time, that even though you had wanted to stay present, like your body was like, I don't care what you want. I don't have the energy for this. And so I'm going to go and do the same pattern that my mom did. Mm -hmm. And so I love that your health was at the place where you actually had the energy to put in that energy investment. Yeah. And it's when we don't have that energy investment to make <laughs> our bank account is already in deficiency. <laughs> Sorry. You've already withdrawn too much that it's, it's almost, it really is like, no, we've, we've got to work on your biology. We've got to bring in energy into the system to even have the capacity to make that choice and break that pattern in our life. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's a powerful way to look at things. It really is. You know, you, I think looking at currency, I just saw a post the other day just about um, th that being related to dopamine too. Dopamine is like a currency as well. And like we, we, we spend it, you know, frivolously or hedonistically and we just, just let it go. And so that we were left with such little um, mm -hmm. resource to actually move through the day or, or a challenge or what have you. So I, I think looking at <clears> that as an energy investment as well as something that can take us out of that as a result of that energy, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, and, um, sorry, go going, on. going and, and laying down and pulling the covers over our head is a way that the body regains energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so as much as we want to look back and I certainly look back on my life and times when I did that, right. Ah. Mm -hmm. And knowing now that that's the best option that my brain and my body came up with for how do we how do we regain energy? We've got to just shut everything down. Like we can't spend energy on anything else until we've rested, until we've eaten, until we've done whatever it is that we needed to, to have that energy. So as much as I, and probably many others can look back and be like, ah, oh, I don't like that pattern. Being able to have that awareness, like you were saying, Dr. Sonia, of, of how it has actually served us so that then we can make other choices. 
And trauma is all about choices. And it's about how many choices do we have available to us? And when we are being chased by the tiger, whatever that tiger is for every person and their daily life, when they're being chased by that tiger, like what are their options? Well, it depends on the day. It depends on where they are, right? Like if they're on a wide open safari, uh, like your option is really just kind of to run, <laughs> like just run as fast as you can, because what other options do you have? Whereas if you are somewhere else, well, there might be a fence that you can climb over and then you can get away from the tiger, or there might be uh, someone in your space who knows how to tame a tiger. Like you have, you have different resources in your life. And those bring in other options for you. And so that's even what biohacking does. It just brings in more options for you, more resources that allows you to have more choices. And that can change, totally can change the pattern of trauma in our life. It's so interesting to think that, you know, you're talking about habituation and, you know, we, we've just come to believe who we are based on, you know, how we handle things. And to think that like, there's an opportunity to actually change who we are, because I'm, I'm thinking of those moments, like whether it be your mom or someone else, you know, in their trauma pattern, because there's so much self-judgment in that. And then there's so also just the worry about like, what other people think about me. And then I better stay like this because that's who I am. And I mean, <clears throat> there's so much there to let go of. And you know, I just think of a, a journey, you know, you know, something that you talked about before was just, you know, we've got to be able to feel safe before we can start to heal, mm -hmm. you know, a situation like that. Um, they just, you know, the people did what they did and we all do what we do in order to conserve energy and find a way out of that, that pain as quickly as, as possible. And then at some point we have like, we're going to have to, I guess, but it would be a, a wise use of our energy to, to change the pattern. So mm -hmm. Biologically speaking, um, what are some of the tools that you use to help help people through that journey? Mm -hmm. Or yes. otherwise, it doesn't have to be biological. Yeah, solely, yeah, but, no, yeah. and this is this is, I mean, this is what this is what I do. This is what I love mm -hmm. doing is being able to sit back and look at a person's life almost from this, you know, upper big picture perspective to see what are all the areas in which maybe there are hidden stressors in your life that are draining your energy. What are sources of inflammation in your body? What are sources of ongoing, like perpetuating those patterns in your life? What were reasons why those patterns even got established in the first place? Can we go back and renegotiate those experiences, reorganize the nervous system and its adaptations that it made at that time that have persisted? And by the end of the assessment, we've come up with a whole number of things, right? And that again is, is one of the principles of trauma is that it's never going to be just one thing. Never, 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 never. Trauma is this combination. It's, it's the whole thing, right? And when you even hear people talk about their life, when they've gone into that overwhelm place, they say, oh my, it's just, it's just too much. Like the whole thing, just my whole life it's too much. Like it's not just one thing in their life. It's that and that and that and that. And all together, they've been left to feel like they have no choice other than to just shut down, <laughs> pull the blankets mm -hmm. over their head. So we look at all of these different factors that go into what is providing regulation of the nervous system in the moment. And regulation is just that term that uh, the, the biology equivalent would be homeostasis, right? This internal balance, this internal health, this internal flow and flexibility. And as soon as trauma starts to come into our biology, we start becoming more rigid and more rigid and more rigid. And then what happens when you become rigid though, right? Like, so if, if I put something rigid on the table and I, and I roll something at it, anything rigid is just going to fall over. Whereas if I put like a blanket and it's moldable and it's flexible and I roll something over to the blanket, like the blanket is just going to absorb it and just stay there. Like there's just this flexibility that comes with regulation and homeostasis. And that's how, and when we're going to be our best and being able to recognize all of the biology factors that are going into promoting rigidity in our lives that will make us more prone to falling over when something hits us. And there's always these different things. So in, in my certification course, for example, there are eight different modules for all of the different areas that I 
look at because they they're directly playing such a role on the nervous system. One of the one of the ones the, the modules that my audience loves the most is the attachment and neurodevelopment module. And what I do in that module is I teach them there there are specific stages of development of the brain and the nervous system, the brain stem that correlate with the relationship and the attachment that's happening at the same time. And that any gaps, any injuries at certain stages, so at zero to six months of life or six to 18 months of life, it's going to have specific adaptations that the nervous system is going to do that I can tell them. And people are like, oh my goodness, like that's me. So for example, if there was any gap or injury in zero to six months of life, their adaptation is to brace themselves so that they don't feel anything. Because if a baby who cannot regulate their own nervous system when they are born, if they are experiencing overwhelming body sensations due to lack of the co-regulation that they need or lack of the neurodevelopment that they need, then those very body sensations, they think they're going to die and they actually could die if they did not know how to use uh, this break that they have wired into their system, thankfully, that will shut everything down. So that's the dorsal vagal response. And so they grow up though, with this adaptation that if I let myself actually feel and drop down into my body, like I'm going to fall apart. And so you see them as adults still like carrying everything and juggling everything. And they can't slow down. They can't let anything go because if they were to let themselves just relax and see what comes up, they do have this core fear that I will fall apart. And I don't think the pieces are going to come back together. So I can't even just let myself go there. And that's very characteristic for people in the zero to six months of age, having um, gaps and injuries. And what we can do, one of the most powerful things we can do is actually reorganize their neurodevelopment. And so even as adults, I'm having them down on the floor doing tummy time crawl and Mm -hmm. tummy time patterns, movements, movements that are going to reorganize their brain stem and how it's receiving messages from their body so that slowly they can actually start to receive messages and realize I don't actually fall apart. So it's fascinating to see this and, you know, like, yeah, like that's the crazy stuff that we do around here to actually reorganize the, the brainstem and the neurodevelopment is we've, we've got, we've got the tools and it's just a matter of putting in the work to, to change these patterns that again, we've, we've just come to accept that this is, this is who we are. And I don't see it so much as changing who we are as much as uncovering who we have always been. I love that. I mean, it, it puts some um, awareness or insight into what happens when people practice yoga. Like yes. sometimes when you get into a position, you're just like, I don't know, I don't know why, but I'm going to start crying here or something, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, cause you're kind of, you know, there's baby pose in, in yoga and there's, there's some of these rocking mechanisms and there's some of these, you know, different perspectives and angles that you put your body into and, and some things can stir up emotion. And so this would explain potentially maybe some of those positioning uh, and how it would elicit a, an emotional release. Yeah, and just how connected everything is. Like yeah. you were speaking to, like the the mental body, the physical body, the emotional body, and all of it. So a tool like yoga and movement mm-hmm. can really it takes us one out of our minds and helps us land. And then it goes kind of goes back to what you were talking about before with safety, which is so important. So like having to do those movements, I think it just there's something so primal about it and something so um, connected and there's a knowing as soon as we get into those positions Mm. that it's easier to let go without having to think about it. So I think that's so beautiful. What about cry it out? Is cry it out? Oh, don't get me started. (laughs) Okay, so I'm not only gonna break it, the cry it out philosophy down for you, I'm I'm going to just break down crying for you. Yeah. Ready for this? Biology (laughs) of crying, let's do it. The biology of crying, here we go. So. Crying it out, especially around sleep, right? So there are only three states of the nervous system. There are only three states of the nervous system. And when an infant is crying, they are in sympathetic. And so they are actively 
trying to resource themselves. <laughs> Where are my resources? This is how I'm communicating that I, I have needs. I have needs. And many times those needs are their internal body states, right? And, and they're not getting that connection, which we call co-regulation that they need. And so if we allow them to just cry it out, what happens is that th this is exactly it. Like they are shifting themselves into the, the only choice they have at that time, which is to go into a freeze response, a dorsal vagal response. And so they're not crying because they have finally, oh, agreed that, you know, all I never mind. I do have everything I need. <laughs> Silly me. Yeah. I'll just close my eyes. Never right mind. Yeah. I'm so glad you ignored me. <laughs> right. Like they're, they're crying because they're, they're giving up at that point. And so they're falling asleep out of an exhaustive state, not out of a restorative, I feel safe and secure, and I'm going to get the best sleep that a baby needs. And so that's what starts the pattern of trauma in their nervous system. So that then in future circumstances, when they have needs, what is their brain going to tell them? Their brain's going to immediately jump to don't even bother saying anything. Don't even bother. It takes too much energy to even ask. Here we go with the energy problem, right? It, it takes too much energy. You're going to have to, we, we've learned that lesson. It's best just to go into your, into your cave. Just, just mm -hmm. check out, pretend maybe that you don't have needs, become hyper-independent so that you really don't try to have as many needs as other people. And, and these are patterns that persist into adulthood. So oh. when we look at even just crying, we want to have a conversation around attunement and attunement is the ability of a parent, primarily mother, because this is really early, early life stuff. And it's that ability for a mother to have that nonverbal communication with her infant on such a level that she knows what it means when they wrinkle their nose. She knows what it means when they fuss and they move like that. Like she just, she just knows, she knows what they need and she goes to meet that need. So if we are reaching the point where our children are actually our babies, our babies, children are different. Our babies are crying. We've already missed those moments of attunement. Mm -hmm. Those are moments that, that started a long time before they actually started crying. <laughs> they don't, they don't cry the, the first time that they have something that's uncomfortable. Like they, they're experiencing it and like, Oh, what is this? Right. Like, what is this wet thing on my butt? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like they, they're, they're feeling it, they're experiencing it. And then mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, no, this is uncomfortable. And no, I can't get it off myself. Okay. Now I'm finally going to cry because I don't have any other choices myself. And so if a mother is attuned to her infant, she will be catching those signals long before they ever cry and frequent misattunements are micro traumas for an infant. And so this is so commonly what I see where, especially in this generation of parents, you guys, ah, oh my goodness, it's, it's. It's heartbreaking to see if, if I didn't know that we had tools to fix it. Um, but, but parents in general, right. Because of all the social changes that have happened, like they're just not aware they're, they're busy. They're on their phones. They're distracted. They've been taught a lot of wrong things and, and they're, they're kind of relying on that scientific information rather than their own internal cues of no, that's not what's best for my baby and me though. And, and so there's so many more misattunements happening in, in your average family these days that great parents, amazing parents, amazing people are having children who have anxiety problems, who have attention problems, who are having these problems that are all a result of their children, not getting the regulation that they needed, having insecure attachment styles and they don't understand why. And it's like, yeah, like there, it's not, it's not, you don't have to be a bad parent to have your kid come out of childhood with an insecure attachment. It's all of these really micro misattunements that our society has, has kind of ushered us right into that phase. Mm -hmm. 
We, we couldn't put words through the time, <clears throat> or maybe we didn't really unpack it in the way that you just did. Uh, obviously, we didn't. Um, but that was the same kind of thinking we had with the soother, too. Like, I didn't want to just plug you up because right? you're making noise. And I, we just we just never went to that. And we, we mm -hmm. tried to cry it out for like five minutes. <laughs> We're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. You know, we just, th there was just something about it that just felt like such a mismatch. You know, and so I love that you you broke that yeah. down. I know but, you um, it's such a big conversation, and I think what you brought up with like the the direction that society has moved into with like the roles and the desires of women to want to get back to life in quotation marks and their work and get their bodies back and get their social life back. Like all of this desire takes away often from that like you said, the attunement that happens when you become a mother. I mean, our brains literally shrink for a reason so that we just stay tuned in to that baby. And there's so much pressure. There's so much like self-inflicted pressure that we put on ourselves to do it all the Pinterest way um, when it comes to birthing and then having the child that it takes us away from that intuition. And I think, mm -hmm. yes, that in itself takes us away from that knowing that's always mm -hmm. been there for generations. And I think the more tuned in we become within ourselves, and this is what I try to really empower all the women that I work with that are pregnant or wanting to get pregnant. It's like, there's so much information out there, but you know your body best, you know your baby best you're going to know your family best and that's the decision that you need to make and that cry it out one is the hardest conversation i know i have with couples because i can see the the woman tired you know she's not sleeping mm -hmm. and she's working and she's got all these things so how do you tell a mom at that point well you know crying out is going to create trauma in your child and you already have this like guilt <laughs> piled up right so there's there's so much to unpack there and i, and I hope people listening really do just reflect on that but not not judge, not blame, not any of that, but just know that this does happen. But yet, like Dr. Amy is saying, there's tools. So we can support yourself, you can support your children. And I think Nick had a question about our oldest that we want to ask you well, about. Wait, does, does, the before micro we get into that, does Amy, did you want to say anything about what Sonia said? Yeah, so what when we look at what has been um, parenting long, long ago, and we see what it is now, there is so much energy that it takes from a parent to go against the grain mm -hmm. to do what's best for their family nowadays. Before that was the default. Like you didn't have to expend any energy on your own to create a community around you to support you, to have your parents, grandma cooking all the meals for you, cleaning the house, yeah. telling you to put your feet up, right? Like that was, that was just what happened. And so nowadays yeah, we've got a very different system. And so for a mom coming into parenthood now, she, she has to put in a lot of energy to go against the grain and she may not have that amount of energy, right? Like based on her life experiences, perhaps even her childhood, she's sometimes being asked to do things, be things, provide things for her infant that she never received. How does she even know how to do that? Mm -hmm. There was an interesting study that I just shared with my group this last week on interoception. And it was a study looking at a mom's ability to actually feel and read her own physiology has a direct impact on her ability to read her baby's cues of their, mm -hmm. of, of what's going on in their body. It did not change. And I found this so interesting. It did not change at all, whether she was aware of her body sensations or not. It did not change her communication and her interaction with her infant. So everything that is outward focused stayed the same, but messages that she was supposed to receive from her infant, she was missing those if mm. she was not aware of her own internal physiology. And so when I, when I hear what you guys are saying in terms of even just the cried out, right? Like, and I can see it in your faces, like it just felt so incongruent with who you are as people. Like, even mm. if they're teaching this, I cannot do this because of the felt sensation that it created in your body. But what if a mom doesn't have that felt sensation? What if she's cut it off? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and then, yeah. And also when her community is encouraging exactly. the, the cry, well, will yeah. it work for us? So the it's going to work for say, you. Right? The experts, the experts. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, like it's, it's complicated. Right. And that's yeah. why there really is no shame and there is no judgment 
I am never going to add that to a mom. I'm, I'm going to just say, you know what? I know that you are doing the best that you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. And let's figure out how to make that better. Right. right. Let's figure out how to bring in more energy into the system, into your system so that you have more resources and you have more choices because you have more energy to put in and invest into the, into the situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you were telling such an interesting story of neurodevelopment and uh, Sonia and I do have a, like a a little uh, exercise that we want to take you through in our own personal cool. life that me curious. <laughs> but, but yeah, you're I'm bringing leaning in now <laughs> yeah exactly we get to wait uh so the, you you brought up some interesting stuff around the neurodevelopmental thing so you you mentioned the zero to six do you do you want to is there anything you more you want to share in that story with like six to 18 and like what are some other things to, to pay attention to happy to yeah so the zero to six months is all about the pawns level development in the brainstem And so in, when a baby is born, they have their medulla completely developed. And interestingly, like that's where the vagus nerve comes out of. Mm -hmm. That's the area of your brainstem that controls all of your autonomic functions so that a baby truly can survive life on earth, but it has no ability to regulate its own nervous system and all of these adaptations to its environment. That's what's that's its main job in the first year of life is figuring out what is my environment and how do I adapt to survive this, this environment that I was born into. And so with the pawns level, that is all about some of these very survival basics. Like, can I feel heat? Can I feel cold? Can I feel when I'm hungry? And so when you have people who had gaps or injuries at this level, Oftentimes they are the ones that will be like, I, I don't feel when I'm hungry. Like, I won't know that I'm hungry until I have to eat right now. Like right, right now, (laughs) I can't wait five minutes to cook myself a healthy meal. I don't know why I don't get those cues, but once I feel hungry, I have to eat right, right now. Mm -hmm. And, and those are uh, 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 (laughs) (laughs) so subtle (laughs) cue. I'm just shifting my weight in my chair. There's nothing going on here. (laughs) Carry on. on. (laughs) So there's, there's a thing called contagious fear and contagious fear is a form of trauma that we can experience when we are around other people and they are experiencing fear. And interestingly enough, that Fear is the most contagious when someone breaks eye contact and looks away, but there's still fear in their eyes. So Nick, if you had stayed looking at me just then, like I would not have had that, you know, like uh, you wouldn't have, have, you know, like passed on the fear to me, but because you looked away and I could still see the, like the discomfort in in your (laughs) eyes, like we just had that moment of contagious fear. Wow. Yeah, there it is. There real it time is. example. <laughs> That's fascinating. So when you fascinating, when, yeah. See, so when you look away, yes, yeah. It, and and I and as I read this study, I I was thinking about it because say we're in we're in wherever we are together, Nick. Right? We're whatever. We're, we're on some island, and there's this tsunami wave approaching. Right? But we're having a conversation. You see the wave, so I immediately see the fear in your eyes. And I, I would feel more fear just looking at you if you were looking at the wave than if you looked back at me. I'm like, yeah, that's true. Because wow. if, if you're looking at me, then I'm going to have this sense of, you know what? We're in this together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, but we're in this together and we're going to figure it out together, together, right? Yeah. But as soon as we break eye contact and, and a person is just solely in their fear, it leaves the other person all, also feeling very excluded. And so that's as a society, that's how we actually pass on our fears to each other mm-hmm. is wow. to keep, stay keeping our focus on our fears rather than on, uh, on each other. how we're going to get through this together. Think about like that as a parent in the screens then, right? Yes. Like, like oh, yeah, oh, I'm sort of listening to you, but not really, you know, just that distracted mm-hmm. communication and non-actual, non like, 
I can't remember where it was. I, I don't know if I was away for a retreat or something, but I remember coming on oh, his men's camp, maybe mm -hmm. I went to a, this men's yoga retreat, but I came back and I just, just looked at my boys. It just like held their gaze for a good, I don't know, 15 seconds. They thought I was crazy, but it was so nice to just engage with them on that level. And I feel like we don't do that enough. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what a beautiful example of like, especially the this past two years, the amount of fear that's been going on yes. to think about how distracted we are and the like the non-attachment even with, with uh, the gaze. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. huge. So fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I think this is like a whole hour topic on its own. We were <laughs> going to talk about collective trauma and collective trauma. there was um, a retreat that we taught. I took everybody through an exercise where you would go back to your child self mm. and look at him or her in the eyes. And that was the one thing that came up. It's like, how much of our life are we just so distracted that we're not even engaging with the other and because I think it's scary for many to even to be able to do that, because mm -hmm. as soon as we do, it's such a mirror for the emotions that we might be feeling or suppressing or hiding or the other things that are going on in life, because it really forces you to pause the moment you actually choose to see another. And I think with our children, especially if they don't get that growing up, they're not going to learn how to do that and measure the cues of safety or not safe or all those things from others that are going to show up in their life. So I think there's just such a disconnect that's happened, especially over the last two years, because we've been avoiding each other with the mass and the social distancing mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So it's there's so much leap or unlearning and then relearning that needs to happen as a society so that we can work on that collective trauma together too for this generation because they're they've been traumatized for the last two years mm -hmm. yeah I, I wonder if like maybe that's part of like this grand thing like maybe this mm -hmm. is you know that that distraction that allows us to come back and really connect with people and go like oh there's your eyes my goodness they're beautiful you know or just mm -hmm. really hold someone in that space because I, I almost feel like there I don't know why this word comes up but responsibility you know, you even mentioned the, you know, the wave, you know, if I look back at you, that means like, I guess you're coming with me. I'm going to, I'm going to protect you too. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, when we can't even take care of ourselves because we're so stuck in our fear and our trauma and our story and, and all the things like, I can't be responsible for you right now. And, and like on a subtle level, you know, we, we must be doing that to some degree and, mm -hmm. and sort of leaving people feeling isolated, especially our kids, mm -hmm. especially our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're relying on us to model for them how to face life's challenges in a healthy way and to guide them, right? They know that they're not ready to meet adult type of problems and, and we're ah, like, we're not showing up for them, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So are we ready to go like back to that? curiosity has been like bubbling inside of right you can tell the story so. um so I mean, not to take up too much of your time but our own stuff so our oldest um because we were talking about okay, what are we going to talk to amy about and you know the the generational trauma came up for us and then the collective and then the micro traumas right like you were saying before as parents we can do the best that we can and there's like amazing parents and yet you know i see i see the anxieties in my oldest and you know some of it maybe maybe has been passed down by me i don't know well, both, um, of us. both of us yeah. um and there's this uh challenge we're having with him right now in understanding his view on wanting to quit karate. So something that feels so simple, but yet in his world is so big and it's feeling really big in our world too, in our, in a, I, don't, I don't know if inability is the right word, but to under, really understand where his decision is coming from because we see a pattern as adults in him. Right? When something gets hard, I wanna run away from it um, because it's, it's bringing up too much in me and it's, challenging me in a way where I have to step up so it's easier just not to do that so we're seeing that and we see the value in a martial art and the discipline and and all these all these things that our adult minds see in his mind it's not fun anymore it's too hard so I want to do something else and so we've had all these discussions with him and this has been like a couple of month process and I mean he's he's so tuned in that one day he's like why is 10 to 13 such a hard age why are these decisions so so challenging I know sometimes I'm saying things and I don't even mean them but my mind keeps telling me to do the same thing over and over again yeah. and 
you know, what we've had discussions about is like, are we projecting our own stuff onto him and traumatizing his ability to, to be heard, to be seen and to have autonomy over his own decisions and his life and to make the mistakes that he needs to make? Because as parents, we're trying to really shield that from him. And so it's just so we're finding it hard to discern all of that and allow him to just make the decision. And we're, you know, we had this conversation with a cousin of mine who got his black belt and, you know, kind of went through the same thing at 10 years old, he did, he quit and then went back. And I saw my oldest talking to him feeling so stressed because now he's like, oh, now I'm like grappling with this decision. And it felt so clear to him after before. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what I'm asking you, but I'm just curious about what your like just outside in observation of such a scenario might be because I, I think many parents go through that on different levels with their children I, I got the question mm. would you rather be the grandma or would you be the police officer in this situation in this situation oh, so it's not like me choosing whether I would choose a police officer like I have to be one you have to be I one uh, and I'm going to say a combination, right? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be a grandmother who's also a police officer and still have, have biohacked myself so well, Nick, that I am still just as strong as any police officer out there. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are, especially after those NAD drips. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, this is amazing stuff. And I feel like what we've touched on here is, is like the real life, the real life parenting stuff. Like let's get real. And there's a couple different factors at play here. One would be developing our own child's autonomy. And you spoke to that, right? Like, because you're wanting to have this be their decision, right? And, and that's a, a beautiful thing, challenging thing, beautiful thing. Um, because for one that many parents, because of their own attachment issues, they never let their children become their own people and they continue to make the decisions for them, regardless of how they feel about it, how they think about it. And it's like, Nope, like I make all your decisions. I decide what best, um, even down to the, all of the food that they eat, for example, right? Like the, so, so this whole idea around a child's autonomy is an important one to have. And at the same time, the other mistake that I see other parents making is that they give their child so much autonomy that they don't give them any guidance. And mm -hmm. so it's like, nope, that's your decision. And the child's like, but I'm not ready to make this type of decision yet. Well, sorry. Like, you know, and the consequences are going to be on you too. And, and it weighs on them so heavily because they don't feel ready to make those types of decisions. They're a kid. They know that they're a kid. And so just that fear can start to paralyze them in, in that decision paralysis that we see continue into adulthood sometimes. So there's this amazing balance, right? That flexibility, that amazing balance that's going to be different for every child based on their system for how much support and guidance does a parent provide them in their decision-making process. Let me actually teach you how to make decisions, not just say, mm -hmm. ah, that, no, you, you can't. That's on you, right? How, how are we teaching them? How are we guiding them through that process? So then we get to have conversations around, well, you know, how we make decisions is both a combination of what we feel and what we think. It's, it's not just one or the other. Like it's, it, we, we bring all of that in and we factor it all in. And, and these feelings that you're having, let's lean into those. Are they coming from a place of fear or are they coming from a place of, this is not, this is not me. Like, it's just not me. And so we, you know, can look at adults who have, um, been, been taught this from childhood that, you know, like quitters are, you know, those who are successful, they, they never quit. So winners never quit. And so then come any decision and they're like, well, I'm, I'm not a quitter. I'm, I am not a quitter. And yet what, in that situation, they actually should be quitting that because that's actually not who they are. Like mm -hmm. they may not be the karate person. They may be the guitar person. And so by quitting this, that allows them to become their best and their calling on their life. 
And so being able to help them learn and know, like, how do you tell the difference between, is this feeling coming from a fear place? And I'm, I'm just afraid, right? I'm just, I'm just afraid or, you know, like it's too hard. It's too hard. Let's lean into that. Like, what is that about versus I'm just not digging this. This is, this is just not me. This is just not me. Okay. Well, let's go find out what is you, because that's like, you're going to love that and and you're going to shine and you're going to, you're going to put a lot of work into that. And so even just guiding them in terms of knowing when to quit Mm -hmm. and sometimes quitting is the best thing. When do you know when they're manipulating you? Because oh. our, <laughs> ours is so keen and smart and he listens to all our conversations. So those are the words he actually used. And he said, well, you know, this, this isn't who I am. And <laughs> you have to allow me to figure out who I am. <laughs> this yeah. is my life. And because we, he loves soccer right now, but he has a really easy coach. And so what we said, you know, one day you're going to come across a coach that's going to challenge you because they see your potential. And how, how do you feel like you'll respond to that? Well, I will love it. I will lean into it. I, he didn't use those exact words, but those, that's the tone he used with us. And then you're like, okay, he's saying all the right things. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know if, where mm-hmm. that's coming from, but mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as a parent, like you have so much insight into the patterns, Mm -hmm. right? You have so much insight into the patterns. And so, uh, there are, there are times when in these types of situations, I have said, all right, you're saying this, I want you to write out a plan for how you are going to find out what is the best for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than just quitting this and not having any plan, that's not an option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you want to create a different plan, okay, I'm open to that. And we can have a conversation. We can have a conversation about it. I'm not going to be rigid and let's, yeah, like, let's have Mm -hmm. you do that work because this for right now is what I feel is our next best step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the goal in bringing up this conversation or this example was that what you brought up in the beginning, like when does the stress turn into a trauma? So when does this like stress of this karate situation turn into this trauma of like, I'm not being heard. I'm not being seen. I have zero Mm -hmm. control over my life. So I have to surrender. And that trickles into his adulthood. It's like, how do we support it in a way where it doesn't turn into that but instead it is like yes it's a bit of a stress right now but we help them just navigate that and you know the stress on our nervous system as well (laughs) in dealing with a Mm -hmm. Mm preteen and so being able to read kind of their their system to know what is their current capacity for holding discomfort and holding stress And for every child that's different, right. For every child that's different. And so being able to see, is, is he going into a place of, of overwhelm and just shutting down? Or is this just something like where it's like, eh, I don't, I don't like this. And if he's not liking it, is he going to be his best? Is he performing at his best? Is he still allowing himself to be open to that? Or has he already closed down? And so those are all things that, that I look at when I'm working with, with parents and their children is being able to see, like, have we crossed a certain line that it kind of doesn't matter what we do now? Like they're already closed. So not the best let's explore something else and let's have a plan. Let's have a different approach. Let's see um, if we, if we see the pattern of, it doesn't matter what it is. As soon as it gets hard, he's, he's done. What can we do differently to, yeah. See if we can have a different outcome rather than continuing to do the, the same, the same thing that has generated the same result. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious for him, right. To see like, all right, you say it's soccer. Let me get you a different coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe let's not quit karate yet, Mm -hmm. but let's bring in, let's, let's, let's take our game up with soccer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's been kind of a direction too mm-hmm. is, is mm-hmm. to work that work that angle and mm-hmm. but it's been helpful to like just to mm-hmm. hear your your process mm-hmm. in it too because again to take it back to what you were teaching before it's it's like giving you more options because giving options because mm-hmm. really like it's like it's either there's karate there's no karate and i think people hopefully when you're listening to this it's like amy just 
expanded the capacity to see that there's all these different ways to look at things, but also these different options that we have to take. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like a black or white decision on anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it comes back down to, again, just, you know, it's like the fire turning on over your left shoulder there. It's like energy it just comes back to energy. You know, if we're so, if we're so consumed by our, our trauma and just the habitual patterning, and then we just keep doing what we're doing, we, we, we have to recognize that, okay, well, if we need, if we want more options, we need more energy in our body and our physiology so that we can actually generate the capacity to, to see that, oh, there's a whole lot of other ways of doing this. It's not that I'm bad or, you know, should feel shameful, but like, what if I just, you know, in, leverage my resources into a, a much more efficient way so that I can look at those options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to be many, many parents would not invest the energy into the relationship to mm -hmm. even explore other options and other, other choices, right? They'd just be like, Nope, I have found the karate thing. That's all I have time to do. So you're doing karate. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And it's again, like it's an energy problem. It's just like, yeah. I don't, I don't have the time and I, I don't have the energy to figure out other options for you. But whether it's a relationship with our children, a relationship with a friend or with our partner, like we have to have their buy-in if we're going to have their heart, right? Mm -hmm. And there's many people who even into adulthood, they are still living disconnected where it's like, yeah, you, you have my, you have my body. I will go along. I will go along, but you don't have my heart. And that's what we want, right? Like when we're in relationship with someone, like we want their heart in it as well. Mm -hmm. And for that, we've got to have that, that buy-in of yes, like we're, we're in agreement that this is what we're doing and we're doing this together. Mm -hmm. So great. Well, so good. Yeah. We want to be mindful of your time. Um, so I have, I have three questions for you. I know you already kind of answered the big question I usually ask. Should we, should we just get her to, to talk about uh, the summit? Summit first yeah, and then. That. Okay. Summit yes. First. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I've cut you off twice now. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you want to do? <laughs> Let's talk about it. You have her buy-in, Nick. You have her buy-in. I'm asking for a buy-in. Manipulated right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what is happening? Uh, let, actually, yes. Let's talk about Amy Summit because she's got some amazing things coming up, and I do want you to share um, more about the summit and how people can sign up and get more of you and just all that you're teaching on what we mm -hmm. talked about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a biology of trauma summit registration has uh, now opened and the summit is airing August 8 to 14, have over 40 speakers. And it also includes experiential workshops, everything from trauma informed yoga and me meditations for chronic disease, even doing trials of amino acids for yes. uh, helping with moods. So we're getting very practical. So it's going to be a lot of information with a lot of very practical things that people can walk away with. And there are topics from parenting to brain inflammation uh, to the, the vagus nerve and biohacking, all of that. So, I mean, in terms of the range of talks, like this really truly is like the bridge between functional medicine and trauma therapy. And how can we use both of them to actually help take our physical and mental health to the next level? It's amazing. So mm -hmm. I'm curious because you, this isn't your first rodeo is for a first time doing this no. one what did you see like maybe it's experiential stuff and i don't want to put words in your mouth um like i did to sonia uh what what do you like what did you want to be different this time about the summit like what what mm -hmm. what's yeah yeah last year last year was a summit right so this is the second annual biology trauma summit this is my third summit that i've ever done but this is um the second annual biology trauma summit Last year it was, it was a summit, right? And yeah, 40 plus speakers and a lot of content, a lot of content. And this year I wanted it to be an experience. And so I've created everything. I actually have a song picked out and dedicated for every day of the summit that goes wow. along with that mm -hmm. theme. So I've broken each day into specific themes for people. And I've, um, I'm going live every day in order to give them the highlights for the talks that are featured on each day. Cause I want them to, um, use, have the knowledge and tools to actually make change happen in their life. I, I am not just putting out content to put out content. Like this is my goal is to help 
people transform their lives. So this summit is, is that, and I know that transformation requires an experience. So that's what this year is. It's an experience. Love, love it. That. Yeah. I mean, and the last one was yeah. hugely successful. I mean, there's so many people that tuned in really got so much out of it. And there's, there's a lot to be gained by delivering content, but I mean, I love the direction that you're going with this. And this is like, to something that's not just for people who have had brutal, you know, no, no, serious traumas. Every, all all every Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And that's actually part of what we'll be covering is like, how would you even identify those times in your life that actually were trauma? We just haven't known to give them that name. And what does that mean when we give something the name of trauma? Like, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that you need to go see a talk therapist now? No. <laughs> right. So we're, we're just redefining the redefining all of trauma. I love that. Mm-hmm. What it is and what to do about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask my question. Thank you. And just one last thing, (laughs) just uh, remind people that the dates are starting because when this goes live, um, we're going to be able to say, click this button, Mm -hmm. but uh, please Mm -hmm. tell us the dates. Yeah. August 8 to 14, Mm -hmm. August 8 to 14. And I'll be going live every day during that week, 7 a.m. Pacific in the evenings, there'll be an experiential workshop at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, and that will continue the week after the summit. So like this really is going to be an experience. So strap mm-hmm. on your boots, mark those dates on your calendar, make sure to just create some space in your life. Cause mm-hmm. otherwise I don't want you to be like, ah, if I had only known that I needed, you know, this, this <laughs> right. much time to dedicate to this. And it's like, all right, I'm letting you know now. Yeah. And That's we'll awesome. put the link in the show notes for everybody yeah. and on the website and everything. So I just had three fun questions for three you. Three fun questions. Okay. Yeah. So one is favorite nonfiction book. Non uh, fiction. Oh my goodness. How can I only pick one? Um, I'll give you the one that I've been reading the most and I've read it now three times. And that would be scared sick by Robin Carmorse. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And favorite fiction book. Uh, out of Africa. Oh, mm-hmm. don't know that one. Okay. I don't know either of these ones. I don't know. I'm write them down. Know, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to get these ones. Mm-hmm. And so the last one. And I Is how stole... you get your guys' reading list. That's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Always. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last one I stole from Jay Shetty on his On Purpose um, podcast. I like this question that he asked his guests. Um, if you could create a law that everybody had to abide by, what would that mm-hmm. law be? Oh my goodness. Um, how do I only pick one? So for me, I would go back to, um, parenting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would go back to parenting and I would say that, um, like every mom who becomes pregnant has to have a community rally around her for the the first three years after her child is born. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. And I don't know what that community would mean exactly. But it would definitely have to entail safety, <laughs> safety, mm-hmm. security, and, and support. Yes. And yep. Food. All, <laughs> food. All, yes. all of that. All yeah. of that. You know, yeah. just all of that mm-hmm. for three years, it. for the first three years. Yeah, that's so important. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Amy. This yeah. was so great. And I'm sure we'll have you on again because mm-hmm. there's so much to talk about. And then you're just such a wealth of knowledge and such a big heart. And yeah. I think that's what really attracts our listeners to listen to you and for us to have you back on. Um, it's just so easy to connect with you. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you.